Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. This is about what you're chasing in your life. This is about your motivation. This is about why you do the things you do. Why are you doing the things that you're doing? Paul says that there are two ways to live life. You can go, run away from the Father, and live in a distant land because you don't like his rules and you don't like his laws. You don't want to obey. You want to do your own thing in your own way. But you can also stay home with the Father, go to church, do good things, read your Bible, and believe that God should bless you because you deserve his respect. After all, you are a good person. Both of these people are at odds with the righteousness and law of God, the one who stays home and tries to be a do-gooder and the one who goes to a far distant land. Why? Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me Today. Today. Today with Jeff Vines. Hello, welcome to Today with Jeff Vines. My name is Bill. Thanks for joining me. In this message, Pastor Jeff is looking at a chapter in Romans which states that nobody on earth does good, not one person. Now, Pastor Jeff pushes for us not to be discouraged by this, as Jesus' death on the cross has got us covered. Turn to Romans chapters 2 and 3, and let's jump right into this message with Pastor Jeff. Romans chapter 2 and Romans chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 9, and just put a finger there, put a bookmark there, but we're going to get to these. We're in a series. And we've been talking about how we want to experience God. And we've been talking about the barriers that keep us from doing that. Now, let me, we've repeated this every weekend because we don't want to miss this. What we're saying is that we don't want to just go through the motions anymore. We, We want to come to church on the weekend and we want to, even in our devotional life during the middle of the week or our prayer time, whatever it is, we want to move beyond the mundane, or just going through the motions into an actual experience of God. Now, obviously, you're not going to have these mountaintop experiences all the time, but there should be seasons in your life when you're really sensing, feeling the presence of God. I mean, God is meant to be experienced. He's meant to be known. It's a relationship, a relational God, which is unique to the Christian faith. So if it's unique to the Christian faith, if you're a Christ follower, there should be an experience that you have with God, that you walk with him, that you, you sense, you hear his voice, you look for wisdom in every aspect of your life. Now, because there are barriers, and we've tried to go through all of them, we've named this series The Power of One because every barrier is overcome not by you trying harder, but by understanding the position that you have because of the power of one, namely Jesus Christ. So it's, a, it's an understanding that happens. It's something, it's the click that fires and suddenly you have it. Now we come, let's go to Romans 3 first. In verse 9, we come to what I consider to be the most difficult section in this series. It is the section when I was in seminary that I just mold over day after day, because look at what Paul says. This is what he says about all of us. He's not just talking about Jews anymore or Gentiles. He's talking about everybody. And he says in verse nine, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Just stop there for a moment. Really? No one does good? I mean, I've seen people that are, seem to be impressive philanthropists. I've seen them do some good in the world. There's no one really righteous at all. I mean, there's some people may be completely righteous, but they do some righteous deeds, not even one. There's no one who even understands. I mean, <laughs> nobody has understanding. And then he says, 
Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Whew. That's harsh. Especially when you consider he's not talking about them. He's talking about you and me. Now, for a long time, I got around this passage by saying that, well, the Apostle Paul is speaking in absolutes here. He's saying that there's no one absolutely righteous. Now, that would make sense because you have to be absolutely righteous to be saved under the law, but that's not the point. Now, we're going to go on a little journey together. You're going to help me. You've got to stay glued in, okay? If, if, if you approach anything in your life and the model is wrong, no matter what it is, if you have the wrong grid when you're approaching anything in life, anything, it'll be a disastrous. Quick example. My granddaughter wanted a sandbox. I told you this story a few weeks ago. The problem is I, I did finally get it all put up. The sand's in there. It took a long time to load that sand in the sandbox. But then I realized where I set it up was directly in the sun. Well, the sun hits it and the sand gets too hot, so now she can't play in it because her grandpa's a not very smart. So we ordered a canopy on Amazon. So the box came. I came home one day from work, Robin, no one was there. So I thought, I'll just put this thing together. The problem is this is, this is not my gift. I got it out. I looked at the photo. I thought I can do this. And then about an hour later, I'm so frustrated. I'm, I'm saying things in my mind that I haven't said in a very long time because the model or the grid is all wrong. What I see as the end product is not right. The way I see things going together is erroneous. So it's a disaster. So finally, little Owen, my grandson, who's only six months, came over and put it together in about two minutes. <laughs> Actually, his dad, his dad put it together. About, it must have taken him. I, I went upstairs to grab something. I might have been there 10 minutes. I came down, it was up. Because Delaney is wired that way. He has the right model, the right grid. The reason I was so desperate for you to bring an unchurched friend to this series is because Paul's entire point of Romans 1 through 3 is spiritually speaking, we're all sinners before a righteous and holy God. I think you understand that, don't you? We're all sinners, all of us. The problem is that outside, looking into the church, and maybe we did this to ourselves, there's an erroneous model, and the, the primary erroneous model the wrong grid is simply this. When people from the outside come in investigating Christianity, they think like this, okay? And it's the wrong grid, it's the wrong model, so what's gonna happen? They think, okay, I'm gonna go to this church, they're gonna tell me the good things I gotta do and the bad things I gotta avoid doing, and then I'll be accepted. So when they come, that's what they're looking for. For us to tell them, here's the good, here's the bad, do the good, avoid the bad, God will accept you. That's how spirituality works in the modern world. If I do this for God, he's going to do it for me. That's the model. So when people invite their non-Christian friends, basically they come investigating the good life, the bad life, in hopes of adopting the good life so they can get God on their side and avoid the bad life. Now you say, Pastor Jeff, it seems to me that Romans 1 through 3 is repetitive. It is. And do you know why? Because this has to be hammered into your mind. It's counterintuitive. It's against everything you think. Romans teaches us that if that's your model or approach to God, that the grid is wrong. That is not what Christianity is all about. It's not about adapting good things and avoiding bad things, and then you'll be saved. Because this is what Romans 3 tells us. There's no one righteous, not even one. There's not one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away, which is a definitive line. We'll get to it in a moment. They, be, uh, they have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. One more time. So if you think that Christianity saves you by giving you a list of things you've got to stop doing and things you've got to start doing, you're wrong. Jesus is calling you to something, and, and this is what we try to communicate to our unchurched friends. He's calling you to something you cannot conceive. There's nothing else like it, which means it's not on your mental map. It's a sort of category buster. You don't know where to put it. It doesn't fit anywhere. 
And if you, as a Christ follower, think that your whole Christian life is about doing this list of good things and avoid this list of bad things, you will never understand Jesus. And you will hate the law, you will find your faith laborious, and you will have no joy, only frustration, because deep down inside, you know you're not righteous. So what peace can you possibly have? Now, I need to uh, quit pro quo here. You do understand we're talking about the difference between righteousness judicially before God and a relative righteousness that we have in the world, in society. Now, of course, there's a difference in righteousness, good and bad, in society. All sins are not equal in society, right? If I tell you today that I played golf this week and I shot 68, that would be a lie. (laughs) If I told you that I shot 68 people with my new gun on the way home, that's also a bad thing. Those two sins are quite different in society, aren't they? One you kind of get away with, the other is horrific. It's a crime. You'll pay the penalty. So I am not suggesting for a moment there aren't societal differences in the, uh, the amount of good and evil, okay? And you have to stand for what is good in society. You do, but you got to do it in love. But judicially, before God, you and I, somewhere in, in our lives, have to come to the conclusion that we bring nothing to the table. And only then will you start treating your neighbor as you would like them to treat you and you will not look down upon them spiritually speaking, but you will love and you will pray for and you will realize that the eyes of God were all in the same boat and it's sinking. Now, Romans chapter three, verse 12 says that all have turned away. This is about direction and this is gonna help us understand what he means when he says there's no one righteous, there's no one who seeks God, no one who understands God. Listen now. This is about what you're chasing in your life. This is about your motivation. This is about why you do the things you do. Why are you doing the things that you're doing? And we said in the past, Paul says that there are two ways to live life. You can go run away from the father and live in a distant land because you don't like his rules and you don't like his laws. You don't want to obey. You want to do your own thing in your own way. But you can also stay home with the father, go to church, do good things, read your Bible and believe that God should bless you because you deserve his respect. After all, you are a good person. Both of these people are at odds with the righteousness and law of God, the one who stays home and tries to be a do-gooder and the one who goes to a far distant land. Why? Why? There are entire theological movements based on this premise. You see them on television. You see them with televangelists. They will tell you they have foolproof formulas. If you do this, God will bless you. And the blessing is always monetary. He'll give you money or success. The problem is, and this is what we've been talking about. Now, here we go. We're going in, you know, round third. We're we're getting serious. It's getting real now. The problem is when he says no one seeks God, it's what we've been saying for the last three years. Most of us are not seeking God. There's no one who seeks God. We are seeking things we can get from God. You're not seeking God, you're seeking things you can get from him. And quite frankly, in the beginning, it's okay, but you're supposed to grow out of that. You know, when I'm in high school, I'm about to play a basketball game, and I pray. And my fellow players see me praying, God, help me play well. Help me do well, help me succeed. Now, I'm not really after God in that prayer, right? I'm after God to help me achieve something. God, help me play well so that I will be noticed, so that I will get the award, so that I'll get the girl, right? So I'm not after God. I'm after to get something from him. Now imagine a young athlete praying this prayer, Lord, help me play my best. But if in your divine plan, in order for you to achieve a higher purpose, a purpose that I may never discover or see, it is important that I do not play well then not my will, but yours be done. Imagine that kind of prayer from an athlete. (laughs) Tim Tebow, very unique, very unique. He was asked one time by a journalist, why do you always thank God at the end of that touchdown? Do you think God is on your side? This is when he played at Florida as an All-American. I love Tebow's response, and I quote, he says, of course not, God is on his side. I am merely acknowledging that any good thing I accomplish, the praise goes back to God because he gave me these legs, this arm, and this opportunity to play the game I love. T. 
Tebow knows that he's not trying to get God to help Florida win. God's on his side, his own side, and he always has his purpose. But that's a very mature way of looking at God. And while it is true that we seek blessings from God, all of us do, and it's okay. You seek forgiveness. I want forgiveness, mercy, grace, wealth, health, even prosperity. What Paul tells us is no one seeks God for the sake of knowing and experiencing God, that we seek him to get something from him. And until you change that, you'll never know him and experience him the way he's meant to be known and experienced. Now imagine this. Here's a great example. Imagine me going to Robin, my wife, before we're married, and I say this to her. Robin, I'm just going to be honest. I think you're pretty. You cook quite well. You'd be a very good companion for me. I think the sex would be good. So although I'm not really interested in knowing you on a deep and personal level, will you marry me? <laughs> you with me? But, but is that not what we... God, I think it'd be cool to be in your kingdom and the things you could do for me. But as far as really knowing you and seeking your heart and really seeking you above and beyond all things, I'm not sure I want that. Most people still look at salvation in the way the Greeks looked at their gods. We're not after a relationship. We're after propitiation. Propitiation is actually a word that Paul uses in another section of the book of Romans. And the Greeks believed that when there's pestilence or famine or drought, that what you would do is you would take an offering into the Greek temples and you would drop it onto the altar floor and you would run away. And when you ran away, it was assumed that the gods would exact their wrath on the sacrifice instead of on you. Propitiation means a sacrifice that turns away wrath. So most of us give, serve, and sacrifice in order to turn God's wrath away from us. Not so that we may enter into relationship. Now we have moments when we do it for the right reasons. Some of us do what we do for restitution. We know that we haven't lived appropriately in the past, so we want to make up for past sins. So we do what we do, not because we love God and want to experience God, rather we want to merit his acceptance and forgiveness for what we've done in the past. Propitiation. What are you saying, Pastor Jeff? I'm saying that even, listen, even when we do good things, that's me too, we often have ourselves in mind. You know, AA will tell you that when you have a husband who's an alcoholic and the spouse uh, is kind of carrying the weight of the marriage, his wife constantly bails him out by telling his workplace, he's ill, he's not feeling well, she calls, she makes excuses for him all the time, she saves his bacon with work, with relationships, with family, and from time to time she'll actually turn on him and she'll say, don't you see the things I'm doing for you? Have I not held everything together while you're struggling with this? Don't you see how much I serve you and give to you? AA will tell you, the minute the husband finally gets into rehabilitation, the marriage will often end. Why? She needed him to be a mess so she could rescue him. She was not loving and serving him. She was loving and serving herself. It is possible to do all the right things for all the wrong reasons. Paul says this is the case with most of us. We tend to do the good out of self-serving motives, not to save someone else, but to save ourselves. Now, could we not talk about this for a while? We could, couldn't we? And we're all guilty of it. Until the Holy Spirit of God comes in to change your heart, this, is, this will be the way we treat God. None of us truly pursues God to get God. We have moments, but they are few and far between. We pursue him to get something else. Blessings from him, health for our children, wealth, forgiveness of sin, which is a good thing, heaven, eternal life, the avoidance of hell. That's the human experience. That should help you understand why some Christ followers will walk away from God later in life. Why? Because the grid is wrong. The model has always been wrong. Their assumption is if I live a godly life and raise my children up in a godly home and go to church and read my Bible, then God owes me a good life, right? So something happens, a tragedy occurs, and suddenly the grid is thrown out the door. Something's wrong. The model has been all wrong. And they walk away, feeling that God has not upheld his end of the bargain. 
And yet James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials. Remember the word, periosmos, stepping on the grapes in the vineyard or the wine press and squeezing them until the good stuff comes out. That's the word translated trial. So the writer James tells us, consider it joy, because sometimes when these trials come into your life, God is pressing you and squeezing you so the good stuff can come out. But he also says, because you know that the testing of your faith, testing is totally different than the word trial. It's not periosmos, it's dokamion. Dokamion is when you test something to prove whether or not it's authentic. Sometimes God sins or allows, who knows, we're not God. But pain and stretching and squeezing is very much a part of the Christian walk as God forms and shapes you into his image. And if your grid is wrong, if you came to Christ because you thought that if you did everything right, your life would go exactly the way you want it to, then you'll get to a point in your life when you think you know better than God how your life should be going. And here's the reality. You do know better than him if the end goal is you. But if the end goal is him, you're right on schedule. You know the cultural lie? You know what it is? One of them? Here's the, here's the lie of the American Western culture. You can be anything you want. No, you can't. If that were true, I'd be playing in the NBA right now. You can't be anything. God wired, shaped, and formed you. You have a calling on your life, and he's going to continue to do whatever he has to do to get you to play the role he's called you to play. You may kick, you may scream, you may try to go a different direction and he loves you. So he's going to put up roadblock after roadblock and you're going to think he's abandoned you. when in reality, he, you're right on schedule. You're right where he wants you right now. You were born with gifts and talents and abilities conducive to achieve the plan of God for your life in this world. And as a result, my goodness, you have infinite worth and purpose. <laughs> You can't have a greater worth and purpose than the purpose and worth that God gives you and your place in the world. Now, stay with me. I know we're doing this a little differently, but you're, you're good, right? You're still awake. There are times I'll be see, uh, seated in my office, and this has happened numerous times in my life, and I'm sitting there praying, and I've been praying for a while, and finally, it'll just come to my mind, why am I doing this? Why am I praying? I pray people die. I pray the church still struggles. I pray... People lie and wound each other. I pray my daughter is ill. I pray Robin's still angry with me. Now that may have something to do with me, but I still pray. I still pray. And don't, don't you think that I say, what's the use? And I remember maybe 33 or 34 years old, I'm thinking, what am I getting out of this? And suddenly the voice of the Lord, that wasn't audible, suddenly the voice of the Lord said, now young Jeffrey, now we're gonna see if you are serving me or if you are serving you. Are you submitting to my plan or are you hoping to get me involved in yours? You don't know what God causes in your life, what he allows in your life. You don't know. The only thing you know with certainty is it can't be apathy. You can't be because God doesn't love you because he's already given his son for you. That can't be why that's happening. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we'll bring you the rest of this message from Pastor Jeff. Until you fear the Lord, you can't even think in right terms. Psalm 134, because you've forgiven me, I fear you. So whatever the fear of the Lord is, it is increased when you see his provision. Now, in my mind, it should be called joy then. If I see what God has done for me, I should be joyful. Why should I be fearful? Because the fear of God in the Bible is the humbling joy in response to the salvation of God. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. You make me wanna dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will break this offering You are my wonder You bring the wonder Today 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 with Jeff Vines Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.